Hello and welcome to this episode of Conscious Design. I'm your host, Ian Peterman, and author of the Conscious Design book. And I'm excited to have Alexander Suma, founder of Ibis Power, on the show today. Welcome. Yes, thank you very much, Ian. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you guys, you've been developing for a, a while now a technology in order to capture all the energy that skyscrapers and other big buildings just haven't been collecting. Uh, start by, if you could, how you started, like what, what got you into deciding to tackle this current, well, until recently unsolvable <laughs> problem? Yes, it's true, absolutely. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so that's basically what we do. We try to generate as much energy as possible on roofs. But let me um, uh, tell you where it started because it's over 10 years ago. Um, it's a hardware product and that takes a lot of time to development, but it's to develop, but it's also a big product, um, which making a prototype is just not very easy. It takes a while <laughs> before you can test it on somebody's roof, right? Right. Um, so how did it start? I was doing my PhD uh, at the University of Miami in Florida. Uh, I'm Dutch. I came from the Netherlands and I was studying there for a year. And I went for the first time back to the Netherlands. So, you know, I, I turned off the air conditioning, got my luggage, uh, got the taxi to the, uh, to the airport. And even before I got there, my landlady called me and she, she asked me if I was out of my mind for turning off the air conditioning. Well, I, I grew up in the Netherlands and what you do, if you leave the house, you put it on 10 Celsius, the heating, right? Because you want to save money uh, right. because you're not there. Uh, well, there is this in, in Miami, it's a very high humidity. That's why you need to keep cooling the house. Otherwise you get mold and other issues in the structure. And I didn't know that, but it did make me realize that when I was back in Miami, after coming back from the Netherlands, when I was back in Miami and I was walking to the university, that all the air conditioning uh, units were turning on at every house that I walked by. And all those people were at work in their offices, also in air conditioned environment. And then you have all the, well, the university, you have all the restaurants, 6 million people in multiple buildings running air conditioning 24 seven. And, and like I said, this was 10 years ago. So there were just a couple of solar panels in the whole United States at that moment. <laughs> and yeah. I thought, and, and I thought, well, we, that's, we, we have to do that differently because there's coal plants in the north of Miami. They were pumping all that energy. And I was like, this is not the way that we can go forward. We have to do something about it. And I completely agree. You cannot live in Miami without air conditioning. <laughs> uh, that's absolutely impossible, especially in the summer. Um, but we had to find another way. And, and from my background as an architect and a structural engineer, and my PhD was in civil engineering. Uh, I was sitting in the classroom uh, and I was asked to do a project uh, about sustainable construction. And I have to admit the class wasn't too exciting. So I immediately dove into it and started sketching. And I was combining uh, wind and solar energy in a rooftop design, uh, because what was my goal is to basically get, find a way to get all the energy in the, uh, vicinity of the building and exchange that with the building to make a, a self-sustaining building and mm. and coming from the netherlands which is north europe we don't have as much sun in florida and there is a lot of wind but it's more in the coastal environment and i saw how much energy there is available in miami and i wanted to make use of all of that and that's how i integrated it now it's it's nice because when i look back at that design it looks completely different but all the basic principles are still in uh, power nest as we call it today. Now, what, what happened after? I wanted to go to a conference in, uh, in Hawaii and there was like a sponsorship possibility by the National Science Foundation I had to make a poster and then I could win the trip and they would pay all the costs. So who doesn't want to go to Hawaii, right? right. So I, <laughs> even when you live in Miami, you still want to go to Hawaii. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did all those calculations. I made a poster and I thought, wow, these actually these outcomes are much better than I expected. So I went to the vice provost of technology transfer uh, of the university. I showed him the poster and I explained them what it was. 
And he locked the door. He picked up the phone, called the patent attorney, uh, the director. They had to come immediately. And he, he, told, he told me, uh, what's going to happen now and what you designed, you can't share any detail, not even with your mom. And when I, within five years, you're going to be a millionaire. About that, I still have to call him. <laughs> it didn't happen in five years. Um, but that's how the journey started. And, and so I got like a team of, of researchers from the university. We were doing wind tunnel tests, all that fundamental research. Uh, uh, patents were applied for. And three weeks later, I was fully coached and was on the stage with uh, angel investors uh, to pitch uh, the business idea actually behind it. Um, and, and that's how it started. So that's yeah, fast. It, it was really fast and it was exciting. And I was a engineering architecture student. If I look at myself, I was so blue. I, you know, if I look back, I, I, I was really a child. Um, hey. But I was there on, on the stage and I, you know, I went into this rapid learning of uh, business, um, but also this fundamental technology and how to bring a product on the market. It, it still took a lot of time because this, this is more than 10 years ago. Um, but like I right. said, it's, it's very hard to, I think the first prototype costed between 120, 150,000 euros. And that was only the hardware. So not the whole team that you need to mm. actually do that and all the engineering. Um, and, and the most difficult part, I think, was the long, what took the most time is to get it on somebody's roof, a new product with a rotating turbine and um it wasn't really the the building owner they wanted it it the residents in the building they were open for it but especially the municipality to give a permit that we would mm. put something on the roof uh, that yeah. could be a dangerous thing right that's that's right, how right. they look at it. yeah yeah it's always so, it's always the regulation that starts the, starts to yeah. slow things down once you once you need a government signature that's what it's especially and just scale right you're talking about an entire building and roof like it's not a it's not a small product right it's not it's not something you can hold at all yeah it's it's around 15 feet in height so it's it's a little bit more than a floor level so you're really talking about a substantial addition if if we would make it smaller let's say less high that would also mean uh, it's going to produce much, much less energy and then the economics wouldn't work. So you really need that mm. height to, but that's why it's for uh, for high, medium to high rise buildings. It's applicable for buildings of five levels or higher um, oh, okay. because it, it generates six to 10 times more than the conventional way of solar panels. Um, but then it's also for high rise buildings to really capture all that wind flow and then that uh, roof addition in terms of height makes a lot of sense. It, it falls into the ratio of the building height. Does that have to do with power? So does it work better on taller buildings? Is there kind of an, an increase in efficiency that it's just below five stories? It just doesn't, it doesn't yeah, generate close, enough? Yeah, closer to the ground, you have uh, lower wind speeds and more turbulence. Um, so from five levels or higher, we're above the trees, we're above the dwelling houses. So you, you capture the free wind uh, that comes into the city. There could be high rises around it. That's not a big pr problem, depends on what is the uh, main wind direction. Um, so that's okay. how we usually communicate minimum five levels. But if it's really at the, uh, the shore, like let's say at the beach where there's an open land or open sea in front of it, yeah, you can basically put it on a one level building, but 15 feet on a one level building is also architecturally challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a lot to add <laughs> to, one, yeah. to one story. So yeah, exactly. yeah. You, you mentioned it, it's wind and solar. So obviously the solar part, that seems pretty, pretty normal from everything I've seen. There's nothing radically different about the solar but maybe there, maybe there is something special you put in there but you also added these vertical turbines which that's where i feel like people have been trying to figure out how to use vertical turbines for a while <laughs> and i actually talked to somebody else who's, who's developing some different ones to go outside but it's been a lot like it's been years <laughs> since we've had them so i'm curious about 
the technology, like why, why is it a good fit for this particular application? And how, how did you arrive in this, this uh, combination? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you asked because many people look at PowerNest and they see a solar panel deck with a wind turbine under it, but it's much more than that. It's the secret sauce that we add. Um, so we're able to capture the wind flow, and I wish I could show you visualiz uh, visualizations of simulations that we have. Um, but so we, we capture the wind flow from the facade, and uh, we capture that with louvers and a canopy of three feet over the facade. So it's captured inward, and then it's directed through a, um, a Venturi funnel, and this funnel accelerates the wind flow between 140 and 160 percent. So the turbine produces uh, four times more compared of being in the free wind outside the building. Mm. And then we use the, the whole roof plus that three feet um, canopy. So we use more than 100% of the roof space fully for solar where the installations are under it. And what that wind flow that goes through that turbine also goes under the solar panels. And those panels produce then 10 to 15% more because they're continuously cooled. Because when solar panels get warm, their efficiency drops. So if you have a hot summer day, actually your panels are producing less. Uh, right. We solve that. And, and then we have a fourth way, which is that um, because we have that 15 feet height, we have our horizontal plating inside. We make that white and also we make the roof white. And then we use the internal uh, solar reflections. We use a bifacial panel that also has cells on the bottom. So on all those panels, we generate energy on the top, but also the reflections from the bottom. And that produces 20 to 30% more uh, solar energy from all those solar panels on the whole roof. So that's how we wow. integrate and, and really try to get the best of the solar and of the wind in one architectural integrated system. Hey, it's Ian here. So glad you're enjoying this episode of Conscious Design. If you want the full scoop on Conscious Design, what it is, how we do it, how you can do it, then check out our book. We wrote it so creative entrepreneurs like you can code social and environmental responsibility right into your brand's DNA. You can download the first chapter for free. Link is in the description. Enjoy the rest of the episode. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Yes, yeah, so you're collecting top sun and any all the bounced light as yep. well, which yeah. I would guess that would, I would assume that would help make, you know, like sunset and sunrise when the sun is a lot lower, probably collect far better because once you, you know, once, once you're, once you're angled too much, the solar panel doesn't really collect as much. So that means you're, I, I would imagine you're actually collecting longer for a longer period of time with solar than also, oh, just yeah, a fixed yeah. panel. That's true, but we also have a glass panel which has a cell and there's glass around it. So the light actually also goes through the panel. Um, and we oh, okay. have certain gaps in between the modules that also let the light in and we do distribute that. So we have multiple ways to let extra light in inside and make optimum use of the, those reflections. It's, it's only 20 to 30%. So we cannot make use of the 100% in the cells on the bottom. So it's 20 to 30%. Right, but still, I, anytime you can get that much of an increase, that it all it all adds up with with the multitude of ways that you're you're doing this. Uh, yeah. You talked about a prototype. So, where have you installed and been able to start testing out this this unit? Yeah. So the 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 first prototype that we had and that I was talking about was in 2016. We call that the Power Nest One version. So it had a it's, it's different now um, because from there we learned uh, how to make a power nest too and increase the efficiency around 55%. So that was a really good learning prototype for us. Um, mm -hmm. And we were able to finally put it on the roof in 2017. So that, that first prototype, we put it on uh, three or four containers in a harbor environment. So we could do all the testing and validation. Okay. Then we invited those people of the municipality who are giving the permits and the building owner. And we said, look, this is it. This is what we want to put on the roof. And then they immediately said, yes, we want this on the roof. Let's test it. Um, so that's in 2017, how we okay. were the first time able. And, and that was a very important step 
um, because it wasn't about as much about uh, validating the, the electricity production there because that's what we already did but more about the people living in the building not uh, complaining or hearing any noise vibrations all those kind of things so we could take away all those uh, fears uh, with the building owners Right. So from here, we designed uh, PowerNest 2, which was a fully modular. We also went to uh, steel and aluminum as a material. Uh, but okay. that we, in that way, we could use the whole roof um, for energy production. And we placed, we sold and placed the first one in 2019. Then we placed another two modules, which we, and the first one we, we placed in Rotterdam on the Satkin College a School. Um, then we placed in 2020 two modules uh, uh, for uh, the Dutch public building owner in uh, Katwijk um, on an office building, uh, oh, and nice. then if, and then a full roof installation in Rotterdam on a new construction residential uh, next to the river, full black. Um, we're installing now, and we're waiting for the crane permit uh, here in Eindhoven. Um, which is a full roof of 10 modules. So they're becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, awesome. and, yeah, and, and just to give you an example, so that installation will um, make 75 apartments uh, fully run on green uh, electricity. Um, and we have, yeah, we have around 12 projects now in design and engineering phase. Um, some in the end of the permit application or the permit uh, process. Um, we have around four or five of those projects um, prepared for installation this year. So it's amazing. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's going quite fast now. And, um, and, and, and a lot has changed. Also, the regulation got much more strong for real estate. Uh, in the Netherlands, in Europe, but also in New York, in Massachusetts, in Hawaii, there became very strong regulation. Um, and, and actually today there was the news that the electricity price will go up another 30% in one month. And it already has gone up 270% uh, in the last year um, for electricity, which is insane actually in Europe. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge increase in cost. Yes. Is it yeah. Yeah. now when you when you install it? So you mentioned like one ins installation can support seventy five apartment building or you know uh, how how much can I, if you put it on a ten story building are you, are you working to be able to make it fully powered or are you still having to do a little bit of a mix between them between the power grid and and your system? Um, no, we can actually uh, fully supply buildings up to 15 levels. Um, so oh, 10, 10 levels is, is not a problem. Uh, everything depends on the location, so the wind availability. Um, there are okay. also locations where you don't have much wind, like Florida actually has the lowest average uh, wind velocities. Um, and the building height, the surrounding objects are important and the orientation of the building. So we look at all these aspects and then we make a calculation for that. But you can say that okay. on average, we can generate all the energies of 15 stories of a building. So we can also place it on a 30 story building and then we supply half of the building. Got it, okay. That's pretty, I mean, that's, that's a lot of story. There's a lot of buildings that fall under, under that size. And it surprised me. I, I didn't realize how unwindy Florida is. I would have thought being on the ocean, there, there would have been more, more wind <laughs> than... And, and, and the hurricanes and, and everything, right? It's, right, uh, right. There's plenty of wind, just not, I guess, not constantly enough. There's not enough nice, yeah. nice non-hurricane non wind to work yeah. with. Yeah, and is that... Know. Yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, for the... For that wind portion, is there because of the because of the solar? Is there ever a place where it still makes sense to put it in if there's a low wind, or is it? Do you really need the combination? Kind of how, how do you judge that when you're looking at a location and like when does it become too not wind, windy to, in order to make it worth worth the installation? 
Yeah, be because there is, of course, an economic, uh, um, uh, yeah, an, an economic um, evaluation that, that comes into play because okay. um, so if, you, if you have a non-windy location, uh, and that's possible, right? Um, then we also uh, offer an alternative where we take out the, the wind part uh, we lower okay. the structure, but we keep on making use of the cooling effect of the solar panels and the bifacial panels. Um, so oh, if amazing. it doesn't make sense to put those wind turbines, we leave them out, which means that reduces the cost of the total installation, but also the energy production will be less because you won't have the wind part, but you will have the cooling part and the bifacial. Right, so you're still able to increase the solar efficiency through that then? And take advantage of basically all, all of that technology and just remove the wind portion and have it still still work yeah well, that's great and maybe you can install those in florida yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and well if you if you look at the coastline of florida there's a lot of hotels and and residential buildings and it basically goes from one line up from miami all the way up to well, the, the north of Florida, basically. Um, and, and in those locations are all windy. Um, there's also locations where you're walking on the street and you think it's not windy, but when you're on the roof, you get blown away. So on those heights, you still have a lot of wind and a lot of people don't know how much wind mm -hmm. there is actually available on the roof. Yeah, most people don't, like those apartment buildings, you're not really opening windows very much or standing on the roof standing on the roof seeing how seeing how windy it is yeah uh, well, yeah, yeah or they put a facade or something yeah right you mentioned putting this initially on some containers and putting it in a kind of bay area are you and I've, I've talked to a couple other people that are looking at how how to put you know barges or things out in the ocean have you looked at applying this to other installations specifically for power generation outside of existing buildings or does this really just work for a building? No, this also works for other applications. Um, okay. We actually have a second product. So Power Nest is for the buildings. Um, we have Power Response, which is basically a portable version of Power Nest. So it's, it's a... Okay. It's, it's like a 10, 20 or 40 feet container um, size. Um, so it makes it very portable. Uh, it does have a smaller turbine because you can't work with a, a 12 foot uh, turbine in a container size, just doesn't fit. Um, right. So it, it does have a smaller turbine. You can, um, how do you say that? Um, like expand it, so you have like 18 solar panels. Um, and that makes it a very mobile way of um, where we could apply our knowledge of the solar and the wind uh, and enhance that with those aerodynamics to get the optimum out of it. So we, we do okay. have a solution for that. We call it power response because you can send it to, um, well, basically uh, post-disaster areas where they ran out mm -hmm. of energy or you know the, the grid got damaged. Uh, so then you have an energy source from solar and wind that can immediately help uh, in the needs that is necessary at that moment. And it all fits in about one shipping container, is that? Yeah, it's it's really, it's like a 20 feet container size. Um, and it Amazing. has even the, the, the interlocks of containers. It's, yeah, it's basically a container frame with solar and wind inside. Amazing. So you just set a bunch of those up together and now you have you know, power generation and they still they still work at a low elevation not i guess not as efficiently though would you need to put it up pretty high like put it on some supports or is it still it's it's a smaller turbine so it picks up the wind uh, lower winds as well where it generates its energy okay. from, so, so that works well um um, ideally, you would say I have two containers stacked and you put that one on top. That would be the ideal case. Uh, on the ground, yeah, maybe at the coast, uh, but you always need to put it at a certain height. You also need to look where you want to put it. You don't want to put it in the middle of the forest because then there is right. no wind in the forest, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. You've got to be got to think about it a little bit, not just drop it in. Yeah, uh, but, but it, it does take wind from all directions. So uh, the orientation okay. is less important than with powerness, for example. And that's something about vertical axis turbines. They can take wind from any 
you don't have to rotate them into the wind. They can take wind from whatever direction is blowing without any problem, right? True, yeah. And, and the horizontal axis wind turbines are more efficient, uh, but they deal less well with turbulence. Um, and in an urban environment, you have more turbulence. So your vertical axis turbine works better uh, there and can take the wind from all directions. Totally true. Awesome. Well, this is amazing. This is an amazing technology you're you're working on. Uh, you'll definitely have to let your professor know when when you actually hit the million dollar mark. Let him know how off <laughs> how yeah, yeah. off he was. No, um, we, yeah, we. I, I mean, we did. We did as a uh, as a company. We're growing really fast. I have to say, um, the the revenues are growing fast. I think we made three hundred percent from last year. Uh, in terms Amazing. of our revenue growth, so that's that's a good growth, and I think this year will be around five hundred percent in growth. So it's it's really growing fast, and we're working with investors to uh, uh, to supply that growth and support it. Um, well, not supply it, but support it. The growth <laughs> comes from the market, of course. Um, so yes, that's how we're. Um, we have the Dutch market, we have the European market, that's where we're focusing on, and we're making first steps in the United States, we're talking with a lot of uh, project developers, um, who are also very in need of finding solutions for their medium to high rise buildings, and it's not only the legislation that is demanding it, um, but it's also the, the tenants of buildings who are demanding sustainable buildings, and, and I've noticed that there is a very competitive market uh, between project developers who has the most sustainable building gets the tenant so it's the tenant now um demanding mm -hmm. sustainability and that's very interesting so it's not only the government pushing for it i'm curious are you looking are you seeing more new construction or are you seeing more retrofitting old buildings trying to get them more green uh, actually, both. If I look at also the installations that we did and the installations that we're working on, it's around the 50-50 of new construction and existing construction. Yeah, and it's and it's not only in the retrofit process of a building, but it's also existing buildings where only a power nest will be installed on top, as uh, which is the whole retrofit of the building. Okay. That's interesting. It's interesting. It's, it's a 50 50 split. I would have figured there'd be, it would lean yeah. one way or the other, but I mean, that's good. That's good that know, both, we, both you know, need in, it. In business school, you learn you need to, you know, you need to find your knees and focus on it. And, and that's what we tried, but we get the requests from, uh, yeah, from all segments in the market. So office buildings, residential buildings, um, affordable housing, uh, government buildings. So it's, it's really a distributed market in that sense. Everybody needs sustainability. It's not only one segment. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's it's more, especially with you know construction codes and stuff like that. Regulation. It it obviously there's some different regulation between commercial or industrial, but as far as like the green side of things, it's more of a broad. Do you have a structure? Yes, no. That's your that's your qualifying question. So now yeah. it's it's uh. Yeah, not not as easy as uh, as you mentioned. Business school is all about niche down and as much as you can. But it's great. It's great that you're able to support so many buildings and just be able to work with all of them. Yeah, um, and then, yeah, you're right. It's we only need the supporting structure. That's the building for us, and we need a, a power connection, and that's how we can do our job. Well, it's not very much. That's just <laughs> that's pretty much every building uh, made. Which yeah. is awesome. You should retrofit all of them with it, and we'll we'll have a lot more power for it. Well, this has been this has been super great talking to you. I really appreciate you taking some time. I know you're super busy, so I appreciate you you being able to share and talk about this. Before we wrap up, I'd love to just make sure you have the opportunity to share anything else that you'd like to, and of course, how to get a hold of you for hopefully more people to yeah. get your product on their roof. Absolutely. And, and thank you, Ian. I, I really appreciate this talk. And, uh, and it is important for us to share that uh, PowerNest is a solution for building owners. 
because I believe that cities can become fully sustainable and run on their own energy and we will not need power plants anymore uh, in the near future. So that's that's really our uh, our vision. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so yeah. people who are committed to say sus uh, sustainability, uh, but also the benefits that uh, come with it is uh, saving a lot of money on your energy bill, uh, but also yeah. doing something good for your planet. And it's actually very pleasant to have your own uh, power supply because you have a, a much more resilient building with its own power supply. Um, yeah, reach out to us. Uh, our website is uh, uh, ibispower.com. Uh, you can find Alexander Suma on LinkedIn. Uh, we also have an IBIS Power on LinkedIn, um, and our team is ready to answer any emails. The info account is info at ibispower.eu, uh, so that's where you can find us, and please reach out. We have an office in New York and in Eindhoven, uh, and we would be very help, uh, happy to uh, well take a look at your building and see how we can help you. Amazing, amazing. Definitely do that. And we'll have links in the description for everyone to just click on to make life easier. And yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been great chatting with you. Great. Thanks a lot, Ian. I, uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you.